Good morning. Welcome to Fellowship Denver Church. My name is Landon, and yeah, at this point, I want to invite you to stand if you're able and join us as we begin to worship this morning. us. He invites us all to hear his word, to receive the gospel of his son Jesus, to be joined to him and his people. 
So hear these words of invitation. Holy God, we confess to you with hopes and fears, with convictions and doubt, with pain and joy. By your spirit, help us to see all things in light of your word, our Lord Jesus Christ. By your spirit, help us to pray honestly, to listen attentively, to encourage one another warmly. By your spirit, help us grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. All glory to you, both now and forever. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone is solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ.
we, we lift up your name this morning in praise. As we sing these songs, Lord, as we, um, as we dig into your word, I, I pray that you would draw our hearts to you. Lord, that you would refocus our, our attention and our affection toward you this morning. Lord, we, we give this time to you as we, um, as we gather together to worship you, Lord. We are yours. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Good morning. It is good to be with you um, and good to gather together. It's feeling like fall officially this morning, which is really nice. Uh, I know it's been feeling like that for a few days, so glad that you're with us. Hey, I have a few announcements to share with you, but before I do, I need to just commend us as a community because there are some things that I'm seeing that are beautiful and they're part of the mission of God here in Denver and in the world. Over this past weekend, I heard of several gatherings of, of people that included a bunch of people who follow Jesus and have discovered the original Jesus and are following him and a bunch of neighbors and friends who maybe aren't part of the church and aren't following Jesus. And I just want to say that like, I realize that there's intentionality behind these gatherings that we just want people to experience what it's like to be in a room with people who follow Jesus. And that's happening. And I know of like things that are planned for the rest of the month. And I just want to commend you to that because that is the work of God into the world. Okay, so like that is happening on an individual level. And I also see uh, that we're, we're trying to do that as a whole church, which actually I want you to mark your calendar for it. Not this Saturday, but the following. Um, we're going to meet up at Ralston Central Park, uh, anywhere between 10 to 12. I know there's soccer leagues and all types of stuff happening. Come for 20 minutes or come for the whole two hours. We are going to uh, get together, hang out. We're going to have some cornhole. There's a park for kids. If you're intimidated by the fact that I'm really good at cornhole... I'm not, so don't worry, okay? Ross beat me yesterday and he just gave me a look. That wasn't kind or polite, okay? So hey, uh, but that day we're gonna gather together, we're gonna get some uh, burritos, breakfast burritos for the morning and we want you to come, but we also want your neighbors, your friends, those around you to come and, and just hang out for a fun morning at Ralston Central. More info is in your email. Um, and then one other thing that we're gonna be doing there is we're collecting candy for our Vada High's uh, trick-or-treat event. Um, so if you have a bag or two of candy, you could bring it to that or bring it any Sunday from here on out for the rest of the month. And we're gonna try to provide them with plenty of candy for that event. One other thing is, you've heard about this, our men's intensive. I thought we were going to have like half a dozen guys in a room uh, and we're gonna talk about what biblical manhood looks like. We have 25 guys right now who are gonna be getting into a room. And the room, I don't know if it's big enough, but we're gonna see. And and uh, anyway, I want to let you know that starts Wednesday. If you haven't signed up for that, uh, go ahead and do sign up. We are, so like doors open at 5.30 and I'm sure there'll be a line at the doors at 5.30 a.m. waiting to get in um, like any big event, right? Coffee will be hot at 5.30. We're gonna actually start a hard start at 5.45. And then we'll be done for sure by seven. I know some guys need to leave earlier, that's fine. But there's still time to sign up. Uh, and let us know you're coming, all right? And then one more thing, and this is maybe the most exciting and most important thing of everything I've shared, is that on October 23rd, we are going to have our first baptisms here in Fellowship Denver North Metro, right? So we're excited about that, and I want to invite you, if you have been following Jesus and you've never taken this step, this is a step of obedience to publicly share with the world what has happened inside of you. There has been a, you've put to death, you've gone in the waters of baptism, which is a sign of putting to death the old life and you've come up new. And uh, we want to celebrate that. We want to um, come together as the church body. We're going to do right after church on uh, October 23rd, we're going to go out to the lawn and we are, it's probably going to be chilly and it's going to be awesome. And we're going to hopefully dunk some people um, and celebrate and go wild because Jesus is doing something. So if you are following Jesus, maybe you just started this past week and you haven't been baptized. This is the right next step for you. All right. So if you want to talk about that more, um, and if you have questions, you just need to find me, email me, rich at fellowshipdenver.org, text me if you have my number, um, and we'll get some time to sit down. Okay. Hey,
we are uh, privileged to have Pastor Hunter Beaumont here, who's going to be preaching to us in just a moment. Um, so glad to have him here. Hunter is the uh, one of the founding pastors of Fellowship Denver Church, and uh, he is primarily at our South Broadway location, but um, he gets up here every now and then you know, when he could squeeze us into our schedule, uh, into his schedule. So anyway, uh, I'm just kidding. If you are a kid, look at that group back there. Um, if you're a kiddo and you haven't been dismissed yet from K through five, go find Patrick and Jesse and Ben. Go find those guys in the back. You're dismissed. Everybody else, why don't you stand up and say hey to somebody around you? And good morning, guys. How's everyone doing today? Hey, as, uh, as Rich mentioned, my name's Hunter, and I'm one of the founding pastors of Fellowship Denver, and it is so fun for me to get to be here and to see what God is doing in the midst of this community. And, and, it, and those announcements were actually like one of the happiest moments of my week just to hear Rich go through the list of all the things you guys are, are doing and that you're seeing. So it's just really fun to, fun to be here. There's, there's other little benefits of being here. You, you, I don't know if you can see this or not, but this is like a psychedelic, uh, psychedelic rug that I get to preach from. So um, that's, that's going to be extra inspirational as, uh, as well. Hey, this is Jenny. Jenny's going to read our scripture passage today. Let me get you uh, oriented. We are in the gospel of Mark chapter 13 and the last paragraph, verse 32 to 37. So if you have a Bible, meet me there or grab one of the Bibles there. Gospel of Mark is second book in the New Testament. And if you need to use the table of contents, do that. And we're going to be in chapter 13, verses 32 to 37. Take it away when you're ready. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, stay awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Let's pray. Father, we ask for help this morning to hear the words of Jesus and to understand what they mean, and, and not just to understand them in a sense of like knowing in our heads, although that would be really helpful, but, but also in the sense of knowing what they would mean for us today. So I ask that you would take these words of Jesus, that you would illuminate them, that you would use the next few minutes of explanation to, to make them clear to us, but, but also to show us what they might mean for each one of us today. And so we, we, ask for, we ask for help in, in doing actually what he said. We ask for help in staying awake and not just staying awake on Sunday morning or staying awake during the middle of a sermon, but we, we ask for help to being awake to what you are doing in the world and what you might be doing in our lives as well. I, I thank you for this community of people and, and just to hear the ways that, that you are at work in there, in them and through them. 
and, and to hear about your presence and the different ways that it's getting manifested with people gathering together and, and doing life and, and learning together. It's, it's so encouraging to, to my heart to, to just hear the work that you're doing here. And I ask that this time that we spend together this morning would just be more fuel on that. So we pray all of this in Jesus' name and by his spirit. Amen. Hey, we all know what it's like to let something that's going to happen in the future kind of wash back into the present and just shape how we experience today, maybe how we live today, maybe how we feel about today, or maybe how we process the events of today. Like, if you have an important deadline looming on the horizon in the near future, sometimes that deadline can be so big in your imagination that even if you really have plenty of time to prepare, it's still all you can really think about. Most of your waking hours are just spent preparing for and working for and getting ready for that deadline, that big deadline that's coming. That future events can just loom large. So sometimes just the mere possibility of a future event can loom large in your present imagination. Like it doesn't have to be a sure thing. It can just be a possibility. I uh, grew up visiting grandparents who lived in the southwest corner of Arkansas on a farm. And as you would drive down the highway to go to their house, it, you, you would just pass all these little houses. And I, I noticed when I was a kid and I kind of was conscious of the world, something strange. There were metal doors at every one of these houses going down into the ground. So I asked my mom, I said, mom, why are people building doors into the ground. Do you know why people build doors to the ground? Tornadoes. Tornadoes. You build a shelter underground so that in the event that a tornado blows through, just a possible future event, you've got some food and some water and some canned beans down there and you can be safe from the storm. Do you know how many times that I drove down that highway and I saw all those houses flattened by tornadoes? None, none. It never happened. But, but just the mere possibility that it could happen had shaped people's imagination and affected how they spent their time and their resources today. Now, these future events that shape us, they don't have to be disasters and they don't have to be deadlines. They can be good things like vacations work this way and weddings definitely work this way and holidays work this way. Just the imagination that they're coming can give you energy today. Next weekend, next weekend I have a three-day vacation to shoot pheasants out of the sky in South Dakota. Now, I realize that that endears me to some of you and that causes questions for some of you. <laughs> Yesterday I was, I was uh, biking with some guys and the road cycling community and the, and the bird hunting community don't tend to be the same, you know? This is what I love to do, I love to bridge gaps. And so, so we're, we're, we're pedaling along and this guy's like, so now the shotgun, like how many bullets does it shoot? And I'm getting to explain, you know, shotguns to this roadie. That's just like, that's what I love to do. So, so next weekend I have this little mini vacation and, and for weeks now, I've just been anticipating it in, in such a way that it kind of is giving me energy for the busy weeks that I have leading up to it. That's how future things can work. Now, the big idea today, the big idea of this passage actually, is that if you, if you want to follow the original Jesus, if you actually want to experience the life that Jesus holds out to us, you have to anticipate a future event. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus is preparing his disciples for the future. And there's actually two future events in view throughout Mark chapter 13. The first one is the coming destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which Jesus said was going to be a sign of God's judgment or of God's disfavor with the, with the religious system, the false religious system that had grown up in and around the temple. And, and he said the temple is literally physically going to be destroyed. This had happened previously in Israel's history when, when God had become uh, dissatisfied with the, the false worship. He, he had allowed their temple to be destroyed. They now had a second temple that had been built. And, and Jesus says, that one's going to be destroyed as well, as a sign of God's judgment. 
Now, from where Jesus sat, which would have been about 33 AD when he gave this speech, this is like just a couple of days before he's arrested. Where, from where Jesus sat, that, was event was, that event was still in the future. But from where we sit, it's in the past because it happened in 70 AD. In 70 AD, the Roman army under the leadership of the, the general Titus invaded Jerusalem and they destroyed the city and they reduced the temple to rubble and they plundered it and they carried off all the stuff from the temple. And if you go to the ruins of Rome today, you can see the Arch of Titus that was built celebrating the conquest and the pillage of Jerusalem. That was the first future event that's in view here. The second one is that Jesus promises he's going to personally return. This is sometimes called the second coming of Christ or the return of Christ. We'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute. But the point is from where Jesus was sitting, there were two future events in view and he wants his disciples to live in view of both of these future events. Now, we actually know that both of them were in view because the disciples asked about them. And we have a, another account of this same discourse in Matthew's gospel. And true to form, Matthew's gospel is more fulsome than Mark's. Mark's is the grocery store paperback gospel. And so what you get in Mark's gospel is you get high-level summaries of G what Jesus taught. What you often get in Matthew's gospel is you get the whole, the whole thing. You get a lot more details. So in Matthew's gospel, his account of this discourse, what's sometimes called the Olivet Discourse because Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives looking back over the city and he's, he's preparing his disciples for what's coming in, in the future. In, in Matthew's account of the Olivet Discourse, the, the disciples question after Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple, the disciples uh, question sounds like this in Matthew chapter 24, verse three. They say, Tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age. They, they, in their imagination, these things will probably happen at the same time. Now, Jesus knows they're going to actually be separated by a, a period of time. So he's kind of helping his disciples differentiate these things in this discourse. Now, last week... We covered chapter one to 30, or verse one to 31, and, and Rich made the case that in those first 31 verses, the, the destruction of the temple is what's in view. There's different ways of interpreting those verses. Some people, some Bible scholars believe that Jesus is narrating both events. He's, he's talking about the coming destruction of the temple, but he's also talking about the second coming. And some believe he's only talking about the destruction of the temple. And, and when Rich preached it last week, he, he said he takes the position that Jesus is only talking about the destruction of the temple in those first 31 verses. I, I got to preach that same passage at our South Broadway uh, location, and I took the same approach. I think that all of those verses are explainable in light of what happened in 70 AD. And, and Jesus gave his disciples a clear sign to tell them when the destruction of the temple was at hand. It was called the abomination of desolation. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where you ought not to be. And, and then he gave them a promise. Then he gave them a promise in verse 30 that all of these things he had just said were gonna take place in their lifetime. Here, here's how it sounded. He said, truly I say to you, this generation, meaning the generation that's alive right now as I'm talking, and he's talking to Peter and James and Andrew and John. So, so you guys, this, truly I say to you, this generation, you guys will not pass away until all these things take place. And it turned out, Jesus was a reliable prophet because all of those things did take place in 70 AD. But then in verse 32, there's a clear change of subject. In fact, someone mentioned this to me standing out there just a few minutes ago. said, I noticed there's a conjunction in verse 32. There's a but, which is clearly a contrast word, right? So in verse 32, Jesus says this, but concerning that day or that hour. And the day and the hour was a Jewish idiom by which they referred to what they would have called the end of the age or the time when God brings his kingdom to earth in full. 
when he returns to earth and he makes everything new and he transforms all that is wrong on earth in, in, back into the way it was meant to be, back into a paradise. They called it the day or the hour. Jesus said, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the son, but only the father. So be on guard and keep awake for you do not know when the time will come. Now, the contrast between these two future events is, is, is this. Jesus gives his disciples a clear sign they can look to and look for to know that the destruction of the temple is imminent. In fact, he, he says, now here's not gonna be signs. These things are gonna happen, but that's, those, that's not gonna be the sign to look for, but rather look for this one sign. He called it the abomination of desolation. And when you see that, the, the end of the temple's life is, is at hand. But then he says, concerning this other day or hour, this time of my return and the end of the age, there's not going to be signs you can look for to know when it's at hand. So you just have to stay awake and watch. Now, even a quick reading of the New Testament would show you that the second coming of Jesus was part of the the belief of the early Christians, and it's actually essential to what we call the gospel. For example, in, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, the, the author of the Hebrews reminds this suffering church this. He says, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And, and the term save in, in that context doesn't mean to save from sin because the author of Hebrews' point is he's already done the work of saving them from sin. It, it rather means to save them from all the sufferings and trials that we have to endure. So he's, he's gonna come a second time and, and, and this time it's not gonna be to die or to make atonement for sin. It's gonna be, it's gonna be to transform the world and to save us from all the trials that we have to endure. When you get to the next to the last verse of the Bible in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, Jesus speaks to his suffering church and he says, surely I'm coming soon. We recite the Apostles' Creed. If you ever recited the Apostles' Creed or memorized that, this is in the Apostles' Creed. It says, he ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Second coming of Christ. Now, even though that was a very normal thing to believe in, if you were like a first century Christian, I, I would guess it's probably one of the least understood, maybe least thought about or meditated on dimensions of the gospel today. And, and because we don't meditate on it much, it actually distorts our faith. So a lot of people even struggle with this. They, they wonder like why this is really important or if he's really returning, like he... He said he was coming soon, but 2,000 years doesn't seem that soon. <laughs> and, then, and then if you're like me, you're like, I mean, I've got a life to live, and it's very likely that I'm going to die before Jesus returns. So if that's the case, what difference does it make? We'll, we'll deal with some of those questions. But, but here's what I actually want you to consider. In order to experience the fullness of the power of Jesus' gospel in your life, you actually have to meditate on and think about and watch for and stay awake for what he called his second coming. You have to let this future event wash back into the present. So if you would say something like, you know, I, I, I'm a Christian, but I, my faith is pretty dull. There's not a lot of joy in it. If if you are really struggling with, like all of us do, if you're really struggling with something that is deeply dissatisfying or sad, this needs to shape your imagination. If, if you would say your faith is dull, it might be that this hasn't shaped your imagination in the way that it, that it is supposed to. And so today I just wanna help us meditate on it and, and imagine what this might mean for us. Look at it again in verse 32. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So be on guard and keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. And then Jesus gives a picture. And we're gonna meditate on this picture. 
It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. The picture Jesus wants us to meditate on is of a man leaving home. That's going to be important. A man leaving home on a journey with the intention of returning home. Jesus says, this is how you're to think about my time away and my coming back. Now, we know where he's gone. He's, he's gone to the Father. He's gone to heaven. He's seated in heaven at the Father's right hand. From the Father's right hand, he is sending out his messengers to the ends of the earth to gather people into his kingdom. And we, we made the case that that's actually the way you can even understand verses 24 through 27 that, G, that Jesus is describing his heavenly enthronement at the Father's right hand where he's now sending out his messengers to gather his people from the ends of the earth. This is, this is what he's doing right now. This is what he's been doing for almost 2,000 years. So, so, so we, we know where he's gone. But this is the key. Notice how he described it again. He left home. He's gone on a journey. When you go on a journey, you go somewhere temporarily. When, when you go somewhere temporarily, you probably even stay in some place that feels temporary, like a hotel or an Airbnb. And even if it's a really nice hotel or a really nice Airbnb, like let's pretend it's a resort on a beach in Mexico. It's like better than your home, right? Even if it's a better place than where you live, it's still not home and it still in some ways feels temporary, doesn't it? So Jesus says, I've, I've gone on a journey. I'm, I'm going somewhere that's, that's temporary. I've, I've got a round trip ticket and I've, I've only used the first half of the ticket and I'm I'm going to come home. Now, here's why this is important. Most people, including a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of most Christians, think the story goes like this. Jesus left his home in heaven. He came on a journey to earth, and he's returned home to heaven. That's not the story. That's exactly backwards, actually. Jesus is saying, this is now my home. Earth is now my home. I'm going to go on a journey to heaven. I'm going to be there a while. It's like going on a business trip. I'm going to go on a business trip to heaven. I'm going to sit at my father's right hand, and we're going to do some business for a while. And then when business is done, I'm coming back home. Most people think the gospel says God has made a business trip to earth to take some people back home to heaven with him. That's not the story of Scripture. The story of scripture is that God has come to make earth his home and he's done the first part of making earth his home and now he's gone away on a business trip and he's going to come back and he's going to finish making earth his home. Years ago, I, I made Denver my home and the order of events went like this. At the time previous to that, I was living in a place called Dallas, which is, which is not heaven in this illustration, but I was, I was living in a place called Dallas <clears throat> and and so I made a trip to Denver, and on this trip, I uh, got a realtor, and we went around, and we looked at, at condos, and I um, made an a offer in, on a condo, and I put a down payment on this condo, and I signed some papers. I did the paperwork to, to give me legal title to this thing. So now I legally owned 1,000 square feet of this city. And then I went to Super Target and I bought all the stuff that you need to kind of make a home just minimally basically functional. Like I'm a single guy, 30 years old. So I've got nothing. So I got, you know, plates and glasses and silverware and all the stuff you need in the bathroom and the bedroom. And of course, a big TV and, you know, all that stuff, right? 
I filled up three shopping carts full of stuff at, at Target. I've, I've never spent more at Target than I did on that trip. I, I pull up to the register and the lady's like, uh, sir, would you like to take out a credit card? You'll get 10% off on the Target card on all of this. And I was like, yes, ma'am. In fact, I've got two more cards. You've only seen the first third of what I'm doing today. This is what you do if you're 30-ish and single, right? You throw yourself your own shower at Super Target, right? We ought to start a tradition like the 30-year shower. You just get a shower, but you have to throw your own. So I did that. I threw myself a, I threw myself a shower, and, and then I, I, I went back and stocked up my, my new home with, with all the stuff. And then I made a business trip back to Dallas to pick up my car and my clothes, and then I returned to Denver. My, my first coming made Denver my legal home. And I had begun to kind of fill it with my stuff, but it wasn't home home until my second coming. That's the gospel. That's how it works. You can actually understand the storyline of the whole Bible like this. God is making earth his home. Home is a place that fits you Home is a place that fits your presence. Home is a place where you get, to, you get to shape and customize things in a way that fits your presence. That's, that's why even if you are temporarily at a place that's nicer than your home, like a beach resort, at some point, you, you still kind of ache to go back to the place where things better fit you in your presence. The, the storyline of the Bible is that God is making the earth into a place that fits him and is conducive to his presence and that fits you and is conducive to your presence. Your home is also a place where your will is done and your will is expressed. So Jesus taught his disciples to pray that his father's kingdom would come and that his will would be done on earth like it is in heaven. Now here's big picture how that story plays out. In Genesis chapter one, God creates the heavens and the earth. That's literally how the Bible begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens, which is the creation above, and the earth, which is the creation below. In the beginning, God create, created the heavens and the earth. He creates these things in relationship. Heaven and earth, the, the creation is in relationship. There's the, there's the heavenly part and there's the earthly part and it's in relationship. And it's all meant to be this theater that displays God's glory, this, this home for God and man together. And then there's rebellion on earth in Genesis chapter three. And as a result of this rebellion on earth, there's a rupture between heaven and earth and, and God withdraws his presence to heaven and now his perfect will is done in heaven, but it's not done on, on earth. And, and God then begins working out a plan that he's still working out in history to bring heaven and earth back together. And so together they are his home again. You hear this, if you have ears to hear it, you actually hear it throughout the Bible. You can hear it, for example, in Ephesians chapter one. Paul, the apostle, describes the gospel like this. In him, referring to Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he's lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Like that's the part of the gospel you probably heard. That's the gospel. It's that, it's that God forgives your sin. It's that through the, the death of Jesus, which we celebrate at the Lord's table, he, he forgives your trespasses and he lavishes grace upon you. I mean, that's amazing in and of itself. And there's depths to explore there that most of us have probably not even begun to plumb the depths of. But, but then there's more. Listen to Listen to how Paul just kind of bleeds this one part of the gospel into the other. He goes, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. Like God has a mysterious will. Can anyone, anyone kind of feel that? God's will is really mysterious. And Paul says, it, it is really mysterious, but he's made some part of it known to us now in Christ. According to his purpose, 
which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. So Paul, what Paul is saying is God has a plan that's being worked out in time and when time is full, this plan will be complete. And he's made this plan known to us in Christ. So, so God forgives our sin and reconciles to us to us to himself so that he can kind of bring us into what he's doing in history. He can say, now, now, uh, son, daughter, come, I want to show you what I'm doing. I have this plan. It's being worked out in the fullness of time. It's a plan, Paul says, to unite all things in him. To, things have to be united when they're not united. Things have to be united when they are disjointed. He says, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Paul literally says what, what God is doing in history is he's, he's uniting heaven and earth again. At the end of today's service, we'll, we'll sing a song. It's a, it's a pretty old Christian hymn called This Is My Father's World. And, and the last verse goes like this. This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven will be one. Now, this whole, this whole song doesn't even work without the last lines. Like, without the last line, without, without this future hope that God is gonna make heaven and earth one, the whole song doesn't work. It's like, the, the, he says it right there. This is my father's will. Let me know, forget that though the wrong seems often so strong, God is the ruler, yeah. Now, if God's not gonna do something in the future to get rid of the wrong, then that's just like pietistic, spiritual talk that puts Band-Aids over real wounds, and then the song begins with a meditation on the beauty of God's creation, but it's not primarily a song just meditating on like creation is wonderful, but it's, it's a meditation on even the future glory of the creation that we're gonna get to experience when God makes heaven and earth one. When you get to the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 21, it's, the end is described like this. Then I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, which is the people who God has gathered. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice in the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Now here's the question. Where's that happening? Where is the dwelling place of God with man? Where is there no more mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore? That's happening on earth. Heaven is coming down to earth and it's renewing earth and earth is being transformed by the presence of heaven. That is God making earth his home. So the story of Jesus is not God has made a journey to earth and now he's gone home to heaven. The story is God has come to make earth his home and he's gone back to heaven on a business trip and he's coming back home. Now, this actually helps us deal with a couple of questions that people often, often ask. One of the questions goes like this. What happens when we die? Don't we, don't we go to heaven when we, when we die? And, and we even say of people when, when they die, they've, they've gone home or, or that was their homecoming or, or they've, they've gone to heaven which is home. And there's some truth in that because the truth is that when those who are in Christ die, they go to be with him where he is right now. But this is key. That's not the end of their story. So it actually is even better. The, the hope that they have is even better than going to heaven when they die. It's even better. There's more to it than that. Because when Jesus comes again, he's going to bring with him all who are with him from heaven and he's going to raise their bodies from the dead, their bodies which have been laid in the ground or scattered across the earth. He's going to raise their bodies from the dead. 
just like his body was raised from the dead. And, and just as his body was raised from the dead, and it wasn't just like a resuscitation of his body, but it was a transformation of his physicality so that it's now called a, a glorified body. It's physical, it's real, and it's far more glorious than, than it is today. So if any, of you, if any of you feel a little disjointed with your body or even at war with your body or dissatisfied with your body, God is gonna transform your body into, into one that is a fitting home for you. And then these resurrected people who have come from heaven with Jesus, they dwell with him on a renewed earth that we just read about. Then they're home. Then they're home. A second question people often have is, now, what about judgment? Like, I, I don't understand why God, like, takes people to heaven and sends people to hell and, and that just sounds so weird or bad. But judgment actually fits more logically in this story because the story of the Bible is not God's gonna take some people to heaven with him and he's gonna send some people to hell so there's gonna be a people up above and a people down below. The, the, the story of the Bible is actually God is gonna come and transform earth into his home. And in order to do that, in order for there to be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, no more death anymore, all that has caused pain, all that has caused crying, all that has caused death, all injustice, all violence, all hatred, everything that's destroyed life has to be put out of earth and earth has to be protected from it, never getting in again so that earth can be home. That's how judgment functions in the story. So when you hear the Apostles' Creed say he's coming again to judge the living and the dead, that means every wrong that's ever been done in the earth is going to be judged and put out of earth so that earth can be home and can flourish. It's the world we all long for. And then the question becomes, how can someone like me who's brought dysfunction and death into God's creation be part of this kingdom that's coming? And the answer is through the forgiveness of sin that is held out to me in the first coming of Jesus on the cross. Our, our future hope is this. Our, this, is, this, is, this is what's still looming on the horizon that hasn't come yet and that you're invited to let wash back into your presence. Jesus is gonna come home one day and, and those who have died who are in Christ are gonna be home one day. And those who have suffered who are in Christ are gonna be home one day. But because he hasn't come yet, the, the earth which he now legally owns, Jesus has bought this place and he's begun to fill it. It isn't fully transformed into his home yet. So we're waiting for him to come home. To be a Christian is to let that future shape how you think about today. To let it shape how you experience the, the, the pains and the, even the confusions of today. And that's what Jesus is preparing his disciples for. Listen to how he said it in verse 34. It's, it's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and he puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and he commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. In, in, a, in a wealthy house, with many servants, there would be one servant whose job was called the doorkeeper. The, the doorkeeper's job was difficult in that the doorkeeper had to stay up all night. So we might call this a night watchman or a night security guard. So imagine you have one of those cheap little pickup trucks with one of those uh, what color is the, is the, is the Renacop uh, lights? It's like, uh, it's yellow, you know? It's like, when you see a yellow light, that's just like, that's not legit. That guy's just paid to drive around in that truck. That's not a real police officer, right? And, 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 and you're a night watchman, Jesus says. You're the doorkeeper. I have a friend in college who thought, uh, his senior year, he, he was like, I'm gonna become a night watchman at a, at a warehouse. And he's, he says, it's gonna be wonderful because I have to get all this work done for school. And so I'm gonna sit there and, and 
all you have to do is sit at this table by the door and watch. So I'm going to sit there and do all my schoolwork all night long. And they'll pay me for it. I'll make extra money. And he lasted about three weeks in the job because he couldn't stay awake. And Jesus takes this picture and he says, okay, you're all night watchmen now. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning. Lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. So what I say to you guys, I'm going to say to all, meaning to us, stay awake. Now here's the question. What does it mean to stay awake? Like what does that look like in a normal person's life? What does it look like to keep watch? In the NIV, if you read the NIV, Jesus says, keep watch. What does it look like to keep watch? Now, here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you have to read Christian prophecy books and prophecy charts and seminars and websites predicting when the end times will come. American history is full of that stuff. It's full of end time speculation. And to date, it's all been wrong. And so we're... History is actually full of temptations to go. If you, if you look at this event and then this event and then this event, like Russia just invaded Ukraine and China did this and this happened. I mean, maybe that plus that plus that equals that. And actually the thrust of this passage is to just ignore all of that. In fact, in Matthew's version, Jesus says, remember what it was like in the days of Noah when People were marrying and they were giving in marriage and they were eating and drinking. Now, eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage are just things that happen every day. He's like, that's what the Son of Man's gonna be like. In other words, the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, it's gonna be like normal times. So we should actually not expect cataclysmic signs. We should actually expect normal times. So Jesus is saying, it's going to happen at some point in the future. You don't know when, so stay awake. So what does it mean to stay awake? Well, it doesn't mean you have to add up all these prophecy books and charts and signs. But I think there's at least three things that it does mean uh, for us. And I just want to mention these and and briefly uh, reflect on them as we we end our, our time today. I think the first thing it means is this. Every single one of us longs for a better world and a better life. And at some point in our life, all of us will feel that longing in an intensely, probably painful way. And and that can happen through tragedy. That can happen through unmet expectations. But, But here's the interesting thing. That can also happen even when things are good and normal. Like, even when things are good and normal, we can say, there's something missing. Like, is this all there is? For most people, this happens at every birthday from 30 on. Sometimes it even starts to happen before your 30th birthday. Uh, John Mayer, the, the, the great musician John Mayer, sang about his quarter-life crisis in uh, the song, Why Georgia Why. He's, he's living in Atlanta. He's driving up I-85 in Atlanta, and he's writing this song about his dissatisfaction with life, and he's 25-year-old John Mayer. But do you know how good-looking John Mayer was when he was 25? I mean... He's, he looks good. He's got a full head of hair. He's a great musician. I mean, I would sign up to be 25-year-old John Mayer right now. And he's, he says, is this all? He's like singing. Is this all there is? Now, I talked to a, a, a friend just recently who has a really good life, like has done good things professionally, good things vocationally, is a good father, has a good marriage, has a cool home. Like, I go to his house, I'm like, I I, I like your house. And he said, "Um, you know, I turned 40 a few months ago and I'm just, I don't know, man, I think I'm just depressed. 
We, we all feel like, is this all there is? And, and the critical thing for all of us, whether it's, through, whether it's through times of intense tragedy or intense longing for something we don't have or just the malaise of being 25-year-old poor John Mayer, the, 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 the critical thing for all of us, if, if this future is true, is not to numb our pain. Our, our pain and our longing is actually pointing us to something better that we long for. So, the, so the, the critical thing is not to just cover over the pain with work or with hobbies or with something stronger than that. Because the pain is trying to tell you something. Jesus hasn't come home yet. And it's, it's trying to invite you to ask the question, what does it look like to trust Jesus with my life in the middle of this and what does it look like to live today for his kingdom that's coming? And your dissatisfaction is trying to point you to those questions. The, the second implication is, is this. Your work today matters. Everything you do today matters. Work is a, is a big term that just means all the creative stuff that you do. It doesn't have to just be the stuff you get paid for or the stuff you leave home for. But, but think about this. If... All of your work is in the physical world that we live in. And if the physical world we live in is going to be renewed, and if you are in the kingdom of God, then you are working in a world that's going to be renewed, so your work is going to be redeemed. So it matters. It matters. It's not in vain. The last implication is this. So therefore, don't despair. It will all be redeemed. Now, redeemed is a very specific word that means it's going to be repurposed and refashioned for something more beautiful than its original purpose and fashion form. So it's not just a spiritual band-aid word. It's actually a word that says God's going to take everything that's difficult and everything that's painful, and he's, he's not just going like, to make it come untrue. He's going to repurpose it and refashion it into something glorious. Paul the Apostle says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He gives, a, he gives a catalog of things he's suffering. It's a catalog worse than my catalog. And then he says this, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed by, day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So let me ask you, can Jesus' words really be trusted? Like, will he really return? And will he really transform the creation we live in in, into a home that is fitting for us and fitting for God and fitting for God and man to dwell together? Is that is that? Is it reasonable or rational to believe in that? Like it's been 2,000 years. Is that a rational belief or is that just the opiate of the masses? Isn't it interesting that Jesus tied that prediction to his prediction of the destruction of the temple, which came right after his prediction of his death and his resurrection and his ascension to the Father's right hand? Because everything Jesus has said is going to happen in the future has come true. He was crucified. He did rise on the third day. He did ascend to the Father's right hand. His kingdom has been growing and expanding throughout all the world now since he's ascended to the Father's right hand. And other kingdoms and other nations have risen and fallen and risen and fallen and risen and fallen. And his has kept growing and expanding, just like he said. And the temple in Jerusalem was judged just like he said it would be, everything he said so far has come true. So it's totally reasonable. If someone has a track record of everything they say coming true, it, it actually takes more faith to believe they're wrong this time than it does to believe they're right. So you're, you're no fool. You're no fool to lean into the future that Jesus has promised and let it wash back and shape your imagination today. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for these words of Jesus. And as we come to the Lord's table, we, we are gonna remember that he's holding out to us both his, the thing he's done in the past in his death, but he's also saying to us, I, I will do this again with you in my Father's kingdom when I come. So he's reminded of his promise to return. And so as we come to receive the Lord's Supper today, I, I ask that you would help us to experience it both as a look back and a look ahead. And we pray that both of those things would wash into our hearts and lives today. We pray all of this in Jesus' name and by his spirit, amen. Well, we're gonna invite you to respond. And the ways we respond uh, in this space is, is, to, is to, we're asking the question, if this is true, what does that mean for us today? What does it look like to respond? And one of the ways we respond is by worshiping God. And so we, we sing songs back to God, reflecting what we've learned. And so we're gonna sing now and we're going to enjoy what we've, what we've just heard. And another way we respond is by giving. We're, we're, giving is the way we say our work matters today and the fruit of our work matters today and so we take a portion of the fruit of our work and we we give it in order to invest in God's kingdom and the work of his kingdom and so if you, if you want to give for those reasons we just invite you into that and uh, you can give online I believe we have an offering box as well so you can give that way as well and we just invite you into that when, whenever you're ready to respond in that way and then every week when we gather we celebrate the Lord's Supper and, and the Lord's Supper, as we just prayed, the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of what Jesus did for us on the cross and it's anticipation of his coming. So if you're trusting him for both those things, you're welcome to come and partake. And we have these communion stations along the front. So anytime in the next three songs that are leading us, just come when you're ready and partake of the Lord's Supper. Take the elements with you back to your seat and, and partake as we sing. And, rem and we always remind you, this is open to anyone who's trusting Jesus in these ways. You don't have to be a member of, of this church. If you're trusting Jesus, you're welcome to come and partake. And we also tell you that if you're not yet trusting him in these ways, to wait and do this when you're doing it in faith. And, and we don't tell you that to exclude you, but just simply to say it's trust or faith that connects us to Jesus and allows us to receive all he is. But if today or recently you're trusting him for the first time, come and partake of the Lord's Supper. I, I deliver to you what I also received that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. He said to them, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup and after blessing it and giving thanks, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. I tell you, as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Be gracious to me, God. I am worn down by fear. Be gracious to me, God, and hold me near. Show mercy to me, Lord, and bring down my foe. Show mercy. To me, Lord, help me overthrow my past that separates me from you. When I am afraid, I trust in you. When I have doubt, I trust in you. I give refuge to my soul in the midst of my pain. I give refuge to my soul even when I walk again. I exalt your holy name. Oh, name. I exalt. 
exalt your holy name And all my worldly gains are lost And I am found in you I am afraid I trust in I'm afraid, I trust in you, wrapped in your grace, I trust in you, for you, oh God, delivered me from death to life, so that I through faith for if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness at this time I want to invite you all to stand with us if you're able as we continue in a time of reflection repentance and response the psalmist testifies happy are those whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit while I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. my father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres this is my father's world the birds their carols raise the morning light the lily white declare their maker's praise this is my father's world I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees skies and seas his hands the wonders wrong this is 
is my Father's world He shines in all that's fair In the rustling grass I hear Him pass He speaks to me everywhere This is my Father's world Oh, let me never forget That though the wrong seems off so strong God is the ruler, yeah This is my Father's world I rest me in the thought Of rocks and trees Skies and seas, his hands the wonders wrought. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus, who died, shall be satisfied. In earth and heaven be one. my father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and around me rings the music of the spheres If you don't build it, we labor in vain. Without your spirit, we stand with no strength. And I know my time is passing away.
Yes. Good singing, guys. Thank you guys for leading us today. And we're going to send us out with these words of benediction. May the Spirit give you courage and strength to turn away from sin and to obey God's will and to proclaim the coming reign of God. May the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless and keep you always. That's our hope. Have a good week, guys.